It's college football playoff or bust in Baton Rouge. Helping us break down all things LSU Tigers in the 2024 season. Our good friend Blake Rafino of AYS Sports, who does a great job covering all things LSU. Also, go check out his show, The Rafino and Joe Show. They talk everything in regards to college football, not just SEC, but all across the country. Blake, what's going on, my man? I appreciate you taking the time. You know, I've never been on the Chattahoochee River, but my fans and my people in Georgia always tell me that Alan Jackson was right, that it's hotter than a hoochie-coochie outside. And after <laughs> eight straight days of being out at LSU football practice on the Ponderosa, thank God Brian Kelly has allowed us to be out there. Chris, it's hot out here for a pimp <laughs> when you're trying to make this money for the rent. But it's been a really good co- two weeks. Uh, Chris, I mean, look, man, we're only a couple weeks away here, week zero. I mean, I know you you talked about Rafino and Joe show. We'll be talking about games in week zero next week. Actually, on Sunday, we're starting to prep. So, Chris, we're here, man. Football is alive and well. So, it's going to be here uh, here to join with you too, man. Yeah, Blake, I want to start off by saying, man, I I really appreciate you taking the time. Grateful to call you a friend. You and I, you know, I I consume very, very few other shows out there. And I'm sure you (laughs) understand because when you you do your own thing, right, it's like, a musician, he probably doesn't want to listen to more music in his downtime, but there are some right. shows, some people that stand out. So grateful to call you a friend. You do great work. And I know obviously you and I cut from the same claw. So you might rub some people the wrong way and they, they might feel some type of way. And so anybody out there, whether you're an LSU fan, SEC football fan, college football fan, if you're watching this, you're thinking, why is Blake Rafino's face on the screen? To quote the great Blake Rafino, we don't give a Rudy Poo. We're, we're going to rock and roll with this Rudy thing. Poo. <laughs> because here's the thing. You're going to have to start telling me where I'm wrong. I, I had I just had to get Rudy Poo out on the air before we got Oh, there. man. That, that's really what it came down to. I mean. I, there's never been a post-game show that I've done that Rudy Poo has not come out of my mouth. <laughs> you know, like especially last year with LSU's defense. Like I put a picture in the studio. A lot of Rudy like, Poo's dropped with that defense. A, a lot, lot of Rudy Poo's. <laughs> a lot of curse words, too, with Matt House's defense. <laughs> Um, but Blake Baker seems to have fixed some things, but yeah, Rudy Poo. I, I mean, me and Joe get after it. I mean, he was acting like a Rudy Poo last night. Um, <laughs> but you know, we did our SEC breakdowns. I know me and you talked about it off air, but look, man, I, I just, Chris, two through eight, rank, make your argument. I'm not going to argue you, you know, like who do you think two through eight is? I, I, I think that you have, it's wide open. Man, like these other three potential, and I know uh, you have talked about potentially five SEC teams making the playoff, right? Rank them however you want them, Chris. Like for me, because I, I don't know if there's a lot of things that separates two through five. I don't know if there's a lot of things that separate two through eight, if I'm being honest. So that's why I was calling him a Rudy Poo last night. I'm like, okay, make your argument. I don't care, but regardless, I, I mean, I'm going to disagree with you, but I, I see where you're coming from. And I think that that is a symbolization of how deep this conference is going to be. One through nine, I think, is going to be a, an onslaught. And it's going to be so tough to to, to stay in that middle tier and, and definitely be on the top tier of the teams. Well, Blake, it's never Rudy Poo when we have you on the show. So that being said, let's dive into it. Talk LSU specifically. Before we look Thank ahead, you. Blake, I, I want to look back at 2023 for a moment. Just kind of how we got here, set the scene. 10 and 3 overall, mm-hmm. 6 and 2 in SEC play. You beat Wisconsin in that ReliaQuest Bowl 35-31. We'll talk about why that was such a big deal here in just a moment. But when you look back, Blake, at 2023, you, mm-hmm. the LSU fan base, those involved with LSU, I doubt there was a more a, a fan base with more conflicting feelings of how they felt about a 2023 season in LSU. No, no. Because on one hand, Heisman Trophy winner, historically great offense, won some big games. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, oh, what could have been if the defense just had even remotely a pulse. So when you look back on 2023, year two of Brian Kelly, how will you and how will LSU fans remember it? Well, and to add on to what you just said, Chris, I think a big thing too is – yeah, year two, I mean, Chris, going into that, let's remember, year two, Jay Johnson won a national title, right? Kim Mulkey wins a national title in year two at LSU. So three days into camp, my big Rudy Pooh having ass runs out there and says, I'm, I am I did this on the show. I put $100 down plus 4,000 Jaden Daniels to win the Heisman, okay? Because, look, Chris, when you are out at practice, like it was undeniable what he had on the outside, 
the offensive line, what he does, throwing the football, running it. But the problem was, and we said this all throughout last summer, defensively, they are atrocious. They can't line up in man-to-man coverage. You know, Matt House is the biggest Rudy Poo to ever grace the state of Louisiana. I, I mean, it was just the small things that they couldn't do. Now, I, I've seen elite wide receivers, two first-round wide receivers, and a Heisman Trophy quarterback. I saw that five years ago. That man, okay? That secondary didn't look like that. So I knew that we were in trouble. And so, Chris, imagine this. Florida State was a great team. Let's say you lose. You're on the ropes against Ole Miss. If you have any pulse, any pulse whatsoever defensively against Ole Miss and Alabama, you're going to win. Because that's how good Jaden Daniels in that offense was. But because you were so bad defensively. Think about this. I I saw this the other day. Of 21 series between Ole Miss and Alabama, Jaden Daniels scored on 18 of them, a touchdown. Like, think think about that. Jaden Daniels alone, either running it or throwing the football. That's insanity, Chris. You're talking about a borderline playoff team in Ole Miss. You're talking about a playoff team that won the SEC in Alabama, and that's where we are. Here's the thing, though. I think that this, this team at LSU has got talent. I, I think they got really good talent. The problem has been schematically, defensively, through the first two years of Brian Kelly has been really bad. Now, I want to add this, too, because this gets lost when we talk about Brian Kelly. I will remind people the depth wasn't there, Chris, and they had to go back in the portal a lot. Brian Kelly, when he took the job, had 39 scholarship players. And it killed them on defense. The problem was they just absolutely reloaded on offense. And you got a Heisman Trophy quarterback, winning quarterback out of the portal. So that obviously took it to the next level. But it's not – I give Brian Kelly grace because I know the depth wasn't there. Now going into year three and being out there for the first nine days, the talking point that I have right now, Chris, is, hey, man, I don't know if $2.5 million isn't enough for Blake Baker. Because they defensively, uh, I, I, we might be back on the boot defensively. Now, offense, we might not score a touchdown. We might be like the Saints. But I'm joking. I'm just completely joking. But I think they're more balanced. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that is where I, I look at them and say, look, man, could this team be a, a better overall team because of how they are on both sides of the football will be the question that Brian Kelly and this team has to answer. Blake, you mentioned Brian Kelly. Let's go there. Like you said, entering his third season, uh, and it's a pivotal upcoming year. There's no question when you think about the expectations and what year two could have been and what year three in most LSU fans' minds should be and the expectations of Matt Rouge. What's the vibe amongst the LSU fan base when it comes to Brian Kelly? Because it's interesting to me, Blake. Brian Kelly's a guy, Mm -hmm. he's won a lot. I mean, he's one of college football's, I feel like, elite coaches, but He's always one of those talking points over the offseason where it's kind of the question, the debate, is Brian Kelly elite? Is he a top five coach? There's some people that will rank him top five in the country. There's some people that won't rank him top five in the SEC. So when you look Mm -hmm. at Brian Kelly, how do LSU fans and yourself included feel about their leader of the program, not just for this year, but in years to come as well? Yeah, just like what I said, Chris, I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt, right, in the sense of that, look, man, again, Chris, he literally had 24 pe- defensive star or players or rotational pieces that hit the portal on defense when he got here. I, I-, I don't know how to grade that, right? Like, I-, I-, I don't know how to grade that Orgeron ran what was a Ferrari into the Lake Poncha train. You know, like, I-, I he ran it right into the Gulf of Mexico, right into the bayou, did that Orgeron. <laughs> I don't know what to take of that. I know that him being an offensive-minded head coach, which people forget very quickly – Chris, this is his offense, right? Like, I, I I know Mike Denbrock is who he is. No, I'm out there at practice when he's got to play card. I, I'm at practice when he's out there wanting to see different things. I just think that now that they are recruiting the way that they are defensively, of course, they got a top three class. They had a top five class overall. The depth now, I think, is starting to stack up. The, the, the DBs, the players that they got, the freshmen that have come in, are really playing, and they're going to have to play. I think that that is where Brian Kelly needs the grace more than anything, right? Like, hey, I'm willing to give him the grace if he, like, God forbid they go 10-3 and three again, okay? All right, 
You went 10 and three again. Now you got it. Now you don't have the depth problems, right? Like now you can't use that as an excuse. But I, I for the first two years until now, yes, they've had Jaden Daniels, Malik Neighbors, Brian Thomas, et cetera. But just overall, the depth, I mean, Chris, we went out there with 72 scholarship players in year one. They won the West, I I might remind people. Now they're at 85, and I'm like, oh, God. You know, know, like they got some guys out here that can play. So I think that he's a top three head coach in the SEC. I think he might be a top three, top five head coach in the country. You don't do what you do in the SEC now that he has the weapons, Chris, offensively if you suck. You know what I mean? Like, oh, okay, spare me. Now it's going to be the, the the question with Kalen DeBoer. Hey, man, the best defense that you saw all year shut you down. There are going to be really good defenses in the SEC this year that you're going to have to play and overcome. So, I look, rate whoever you want. I think that they could, they're could. they going to be a lot better. So, I, I look, I, I'm thrilled with Brian Kelly. I like the diplomatic approach that LSU finally has from a head coach. You know, I'm used to – a head coach going out there like that, dog, like that, boy, yeah. And I'm like, all right, okay. I know we're all Cajun around here and like to have a little fun, but come on now. So that 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 to me, I, I think that they're on the right track. But here's the truth, though. I say all that to, to, to say this. You go 10 and 3 again this year, there's going to be chirping. They're gonna, you can't come here and, and go 10 and 3, Chris. They, they fired an entire defensive staff. They won 20 games the last two years. Like, I, I mean, <laughs> this ain't like other places in the SEC. You lose, you're going to get your butt, you, you know, you're going to be on the unemployment line. So that that that's what I think of them. I, I, I still am, am very much favorable of, of BK. So, Blake, as we dive into the 2024 LSU Tigers, let's start on the offensive side of the football specifically. Mm-hmm. Joe Sloan taking over as your OC, the main play caller. At QB1, yep. it's Garrett Nussmeyer who will replace the Heisman winner, Jaden Daniels, at QB1 after his big ReliQuest Bowl performance led LSU, obviously, to the victory, the come-from-behind victory in that one. you got to replace Malik Neighbors, Brian Thomas Jr. on the outside. Those guys are going to the NFL. Kyron Lacey looks to slide in there as RB1. you got Chris Hilton Jr., Xavion Thomas, C.J. Daniels, guys who figure to be other big-time playmakers, amongst others as well. It's a deep wide receiver room. Very uh, deep. Caleb Jackson and Josh Williams – Look to spark the running game this season. I know there's been a lot of preseason hype for those guys from yourself and other LSU folks that I've talked to. But it all starts up front for LSU. Four or five starters back on the offensive line. You've got other Mm -hmm. guys that have played. It's arguably the best offensive line in college football, not just the SEC. So the question is, Blake, not just what you're expecting from the LSU offense this year because so much is different, but can different be – I don't know that I can say it can be better because, again, you had the Heisman Trophy winner – you had Malik Neighbors, you had Brian Thomas Jr. But can different be just as good? Can different be almost just as good? Because it was elite last year. What are you expecting from the offensive side of the football? Yeah, I think they're going to run the football, and I think they're going to pound the rock. You know, I, I really do. Look, I know Dave talked about this, and me and Dave, you know, who's on your network, me and him have gone back and forth on Twitter. If you don't know who Kayla Jackson is right now, you better get to know him. And you better get to know him really quickly. Chris, he's I, – I don't – I don't want to put this on him because, I mean, the kids only rushed for like 200 yards in, in in college football. He reminds me of Nick Chubb, man. I, I mean, 230-ish pounds, uh, can catch the ball out of the backfield. I, I think his speed is ridiculous, right? Like a 10 8 100-meter dash when he was in high school. By the way, when he ran that, he's coming off a – a uh, broken ankle the two weeks before that. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm like you. Like, where do you, where do these guys come from? Like his his paws, but his his quads look like tree trunks. <laughs> and this guy breaks another yet another rush to uh, on, on Saturday, Chris, right up the a gap, and he's hitting the hole fast. He he's breaking tackles and he's gone for six. Now, oh well, LSU defense stinks. Okay, well we'll talk about them in a minute. I don't know if they stink. But I, I think just w- leaning on that offensive line, getting the running game going early in games, like I think against USC, you're going to see them come out there and start punching people in the mouth. And so for that, I, I think adding what you have at wide receiver, I think if you can lean more on that running game, it's going to be big. You know, I, I was text, I texted Jaden Daniels' dad today, Jay, 
And I said, man, if Jaden Daniels would have had this year's Caleb Jackson stuff, would have been very – somebody would have died, Chris. I mean, I'm just, I'm just going to put it – someone would have died out there in the field. But, look, I, I think at it, it, skill positions, man, just like what LSU normally does, man, they reload. I, quarterback, it is what it is. Offensive line at times can be what it is. Now they do have an offensive line that's really good. That wide receiver room, Chris, has been – pretty special so far through eight practices nine practices a name that i think another name people need to get familiar with is chris hilton jr look we know about cj daniels we know about kyron lacy it's been the chris hilton show so far through nine days just the acrobatic catches you know running the whole route tree and the speed you know during the summer chris running 24 miles an hour this kid's a a world-class sprinter he can really get after it um, but I think for me, I know that you have pieces all around you. It is can Garrett Nussmeyer N- N- Garrett Nussmeyer limit the mistakes? He hasn't at times so far this summer, right? Like he hasn't. He's <laughs> they call him the Cajun Brett Far for a reason. My man's putting ball the ball in in some troublesome situations. Sometimes it's paying off for him, sometimes it's not. I think if there is something that I'm concerned about, what does it look like without Jaden? Like, how much did Jaden cover up, right? Like, when stuff broke down, he was gone. Garrett ain't going to do that, man. <laughs> he, he's like us, Chris. We got cement in our shoes, man. So, I, I, I wonder about that. But I really think you're going to lean on people. I, I, t- I say it's going to be more like 22 in a lot of ways. Like, look, man, LSU and 22, they leaned on Bama. They leaned on Florida State in the second half. They leaned on some teams. The question ultimately becomes, can you limit those bad mistakes and can you get your playmakers to ball out in space? C.J. Daniels, I've been more surprised. Like, you know, when when a kid, Chris, from the group of five, even though he was really good at Liberty, comes into the SEC, you're like, yeah, but this is the SEC. Somebody forgot to tell him that. And because they've they've been – they've looked really good. And that's why I'm a little bit higher than I think – than I was going into camp to now. They've been they've been good offensively. Can they limit those bad mistakes is going to be the question. Blake, let's talk about the other side of the football, the defensive side, which I'm sure LSU folks just perked up because this is the side that probably is going to dictate what the ceiling is for LSU this year, mm-hmm. you could argue. Uh, Blake Baker, though, you mentioned the $2.5 million man comes in. He takes over as the defensive coordinator, uh, when you look at the personnel, depth, defensive tackle, the middle of the defensive line, it's a question mark. You've talked about it. I've talked about it. We've all talked about it. Uh, Jacoby and Gullery, Jalen Lee, Paez from Wisconsin, Sean Washington, they look to fill the void and step up and be playmakers. Outside of them, where the heck is the depth coming from? Maybe we don't know. Uh, Savion Jones returns at the edge spot. You go to linebacker, Harold Perkins Jr. Oh, by the way, one of the best players in college football you may have forgotten last year. He looks to return to that All-American form. Greg Penn III is back at linebacker as well. Uh, Major Burns returning at star, a very, very big deal. Almost 100 tackle guy a season ago. Sage Ryan, Zai Alexander are back in the secondary as well. And there's a bunch of young talent that I know you've talked about before, and I'll let you expand on. But, I mean, the big question, Blake, is this. How big of a jump can the defense make? And I know, again, you and I talked off air, so I'll let you get into it. But it feels like if they can be just slightly below average defensively, as silly as that sounds, that would be a massive improvement from what they were last year, which was the worst in school history. No doubt. And and look, this is the correlation I give it, uh, Chris. Are they going to peak Golden Old Miss it from last year? If you remember Old Miss the year before Pete Golden got there, they were in the mid 100s, right? I think 115, 116 in total defense. You turn around and they're in the 50s, 55 throughout this season. They go 10 and 2. Okay, well, they go 10 and 2. Well, 10 and 2 might get you in the playoff. And LSU does have a favorable schedule. However, you're asking me and catching me on a really good day because today, <laughs> They go in a team period. They go in a scrimmage, two-minute drill, and defense wins. And, Chris, it wasn't close. Okay, like, I, look, I, I've said this. So I said this last night. I'll, I'll repeat it here for, for for your listeners, too. This LSU defense hasn't looked this good in the last 18 months. I don't care the situation. And I think, like, I'll just give you a rundown. Like, so they're going through four downs. They get a, a pair of shand. The, uh, tips the ball in the air, picks it off. 
Harold Perkins on the line on the end line of scrimmage, the things that they're doing in personnel wise, getting after the passer. It's a buffet line of edge guys that that have the athleticism that can get after the quarterback. Garrett Nussmeyer got fooled today, man. Couldn't complete a pass. Matt House was so vanilla that Bluebell was about to hire him. Okay, like this man did not do anything that would literally remotely come close to showing that you can be multiple. Blake Baker's come in, Harold Perkins, Chris, in the scrimmage on Saturday, gets two tackles for loss, two of them on third down, shooting through the A-gap, tackling Caleb Jackson. And I'm looking at other people around, and I'm like, uh, 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 you know, because you don't want to overreact, right? Like, you don't want to overreact at UC and Harold Park and shoot through the A-gap, get a tackle for loss on third down. I think the biggest thing for me is that that young secondary, yes, they have lost some reps in seven-on-seven and scrimmages and team periods. They've also made some serious plays, man. They get another interception today from Paris Shan, Jordan Allen, the new safety, the, the three-star, the – Everybody wants to put the Louisiana three-star label on, gets a big pass breakup on third down, and then, Chris, we get kicked out, right? They kick us out of practice because the defense is hype. They catch an interception today. Blake Baker is sprinting, Chris, from one side of the field to the other, and the entire defense is swarming in. Like, remember when uh, uh, Georgia scored a touchdown on Florida and the whole, yeah. the whole sideline? Imagine that at practice, and that's what happened. I have never in my life seen a defense go from one extreme to the other when it comes to confidence, continuity, and just being together. And that's what, Blake, the culture. We love to use that word, right? Culture. How's your culture doing? I don't know what culture is, but if that's it, if everybody buying in is it, then sign me up because I will run through a wall for Blake Baker, what he's done the last two days. Now, Can they translate, Chris, the last two days that we've seen them win? They've won the practices. 11-on-11, they have won against what everybody thinks is going to be a pretty solid offense. If that happens and they can translate it onto the field, you you can beat USC. You can go into Ole Miss, okay, undefeated. Then you really start cooking. I think this is the deepest team that they've had since 2019. I don't think it's remotely close. I think that the depth is there. The question is, is that, again, you're coming out with a new starting quarterback. Can you go to Kyle Field on the road and win? Ole Miss, can you can you redeem yourself off of that? Can you get now get over the hump against Alabama, that, even though that they're coming into your house and that Nick Saban's not there? I know this. Defensively, They're not going to be passive. They're not going to be vanilla. I love what I'm seeing from Blake Baker. I love what I'm seeing from Harold Perkins. And I just pray to God, sweet by you, Jesus above, please (laughs) send blitzes on third down. That's what they were missing the last two years. And I think if they do that and they they have that consistency, which they've been lacking at times somewhat, uh, I think that they're going to be night and day better. If they get in the mid-50s, Chris, it wouldn't shock me at all from what I've seen. Like, let's talk a little special teams quickly. Damian Ooh. Ramos. Yeah, let's talk a little special teams. Okay. Damian Ramos back at the kicker spot. He led the FBS in extra points made, and he went 12 for 15 on his field goals. Peyton Todd taking over at punter. And uh, it looks like Xavier Thomas from folks I've talked to, and I think I've heard you say maybe emerging as a playmaker in special. Obviously, like mm-hmm. you mentioned, there's plenty of skill position guys, plenty of options. So anything notable when it comes to LSU special teams? Again, it's a facet of the game. Doesn't get a lot of love, but – Hey, I'm glad you game. brought it up. No, I'm glad you brought season, it up. It can, it can flip a game on its head. Yeah, okay. You know, look, I think that special teams as a, a in and of itself, Chris, is something you're right. We don't talk about. I think the biggest portal addition that LSU added that nobody will talk about, didn't bring it up in, 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 in offseason at all, Blake Oshendorf from Louisiana Tech, the punter. Averaged 47 yards per punt last year, and you don't have a you didn't have a punter. This kid's down at least five punts inside the five since we've been out there. This kid can boot it. I, I mean, he's six seven, and his leg is – he looks like a damn – what do you call this thing? A, a, a praying mantis. That's what he looks like, okay? That's how long his leg is. So I, I do wonder, Chris, at times, if you can play better defense and you can run the football, if you don't go a little bit old school, 
Let's run the football, play some field position, play some defense. We don't have to score on every single drive. I think he's a big deal here. You talked about Ramos, Mr. Consistent. Chris, we were so bad on special teams and punt return. I mean, Malik Neighbors fumbled twice. How crazy is it to think of Malik Neighbors now versus the Florida State game two years ago when he fumbles two, uh, uh, two punts? But Xavier Thomas has already done it in the SEC. You know what you've seen from him. And that alone, I think that you'll be better there. But I think Blake Oshendorf, at the end of the season, you're going to look up and be like, oh, this dude Rafino is crazy. He's talking about the punt game. Okay. This kid can punt it. Chris, he was second in the country last year in, in punt average. And I think that that's a big deal. We were having punts last year against Missouri that would go 20 yards. Oh, well, the defense is bad. Well, you're punting at 20 yards too. Let Jaden Daniels crow hop and throw a pick or something. Don't <laughs> don't let don't punt the ball 20. Go for it. If you're gonna punt at 20 yards, you might as well go for it. It doesn't make a bit that big of a difference. You're not stopping anybody anyway. So but I do think Oshendorf is gonna be a big deal. But Xavier Thomas, look, already did it at Mississippi State. So let's see what he can give you too. But he's been a little banged up. They put him back out there today. He had a decent punt return. Um, but Harold Perkins was out at the gunner, Chris. How about that? Harold Perkins was out at the gunner. I don't we'll get Brian Kelly available available tomorrow or Wednesday, whatever day that that, that happens. But Harold Perkins has been lined up at the gunner. All almost all eleven skill guys that are either starting or rotating are on special teams. They are not playing around with this one. So, Blake, 12 starters return for this LSU team, six on offense, six on defense. And as we take a look at the 2024 schedule, you mentioned LSU with a bit of a favorable schedule, but it starts off mm -hmm. in a big way on week one, that Sunday night game in Las Vegas against USC. And this is a big one because anybody who's followed LSU for a minute knows that the Tigers, for whatever reason, have struggled in season openers. Have not won one, I believe, since 2019. That so you got to get off to a got to get off to a hot start. You then have Nickel State Week Two at South Carolina Week Three as your SEC opener. Uh, you then get UCLA. So you play both the LA schools. UCLA at home, mm -hmm. yes, indeed. Uh, then South Alabama. Then you really get in the meat of this SEC schedule. Ole Miss comes to town mm -hmm. at Arkansas, at Texas A&M. Bama comes to town at Florida. Vanderbilt, and then Oklahoma comes to Death Valley to close out the season. Blake, when you look at this 2024 schedule, year three of Brian Kelly, what jumps out to you? You got to win week one, Chris. I, You know, you, me and you talked about this off air, but I think week one is the biggest game of the season, clearly. Because, look, if you if you win that, you feel pretty confident going in 4-5-0 or five and oh against Ole Miss. You have Ole Miss at home. You have Bama at home. You have Oklahoma at home. The real test is then now you go into Kyle Field. And look, man, I, I we me and you talked about this too. <laughs> I know that game against Arkansas is always close. Spare me. You know, now you could have an interim head coach by that time, potentially Bobby Petrino. Does he have take over? I don't know. But I think that you it's very favorable. Chris, you're gonna be in every game. And I think the only if I'm not mistaken, the only two games that you're not favored in is at AM. And against Alabama at the current moment. So what does that tell me? That Vegas has seen what I've seen in the sense of that, look, I, LSU at home at night, and I, look, I, I don't care if the 85 Bears are coming in there. Something happens. You know, it smells like bourbon when you walk in the stadium. Something goofy is going to happen. It's how LSU won the West two years ago. So it's favorable for them. But week one, only one game. You versus USC, can you show the world that you can get it done? Because, Chris, if they win week one, I mean, are, are, are we uh, – now, South Carolina, you're going to – you know, I, I don't know if South Carolina, if they – you know, I don't know about that one. But you're going on the road, first-time quarterback starter. He's never been on the road like that before in that type of situation where he's the guy. I just think LSU's going to out-athlete him, right? Like, I, I really believe that. So, I, I – Look, man, I, I don't – so, Chris, I'll, I'll give you a little heads up because, but you know, we'll talk about this tonight on Rafino and Joe Show. They're number 11 for me in the playoffs because based off of that because I think that they can go 10-2. and two. I think they will go 10-2. and two. And if they do that, they're going to be in the playoffs because they do have a, a, a tougher schedule down the stretch. What does Oklahoma look like at the end of the year? 
I don't think Oklahoma's ready <laughs> for to come to Baton Rouge during Thanksgiving week. Okay, and the drunkness that's going to be available around there. <laughs> Sorry. I think LSU's like 13 and 1 in their last games. Okay, like it ridiculous in their last games at home. So Good luck, man. That's all I tell you. But I, I feel good that they can go on a 10 and 2 run. That's where I'm going to have them um, going into this. I just think that Ole Miss and Alabama might be a little bit more talented than them. And if they can beat Alabama, like I, I do think that Al they can beat Alabama at home. I actually, my gut feel that they will. I don't like us going to Kyle Field, man. I, I really don't. And, and, and so, I, look, if, if you got Haynes King and Connor Weigman that, that can do it on you, and they can beat you. That team can beat you now. You you never know in this in this league. So that's where I sit around for LSU. I think that they have a very low floor, Chris. I think nine and three is their floor. I think ten and two might be their ceiling. If I'm being honest, maybe eleven and one if all things hit on all cylinders. But that's what you probably should expect from the Tigers yet again, in my opinion. Like you bring up a really interesting point. The, the two biggest games I would say on LSU schedule. I mean, week one, obviously, but from the SEC opponents, Ole Miss and Alabama, both at home, no doubt. both at night. The atmospheres are going to be, we're going to be experiencing one of them firsthand. Can't wait. They're going to be as electric as any in college football. Um, both games, there are different dynamics. There's a hell of a revenge factor in the Ole Miss game, especially after Lane Kiffin has essentially rubbed your nose in it all offseason. And then there's Alabama. There's no more Nick Saban. But I feel like LSU fans, and you know, maybe you can clarify. I don't know if I want to speak for LSU fans, but I'd imagine there's a lot of years of frustration that LSU would like to take out on the Crimson Tide with no more Nick Saban there. I um, uh, when I bought college football 25, it was LSU versus Alabama. The score was 77 to zero at halftime. <laughs> I put it on freshman. That's how much frustration I need to let out. So if you want to ask, yes, there's a lot of frustration. So my my question though, Blake, is this. Of Ole Miss and Bama, which one do you think the LSU fan base wants more? Mm. Probably they won't say this. It's going to be Bama. You know, I I feel that now. A lot of them will say Ole Miss because of based off of last year. I think it's still Bama. I think when it, when you cut them open and you really get down to it, they'd say Bama. I really want Ole Miss because look, I, I'm tired of you know. Lane trolled Brian Kelly all off season, you know, and Brian Kelly doesn't really care. He's just going to go amongst himself, you know, whatever. Lane's going to do what Lane wants to do. I, you know, like, it, it's like, okay, keep talking it then. Come to Death Valley and win. By the way, I will remind people, it was Lane Kiffin's first win over Brian Kelly in the in their last five appearances versus one another. BK's five and one against him, and he wants to troll him like that. Okay. If you add – Chris, this is what I – this answer I'll give you. If there's a man 40, 40, 45 and older, he's going to say Ole Miss. The crowd 40 to 20-ish, you know, are going to say Alabama because of the recency. People forget the Magnolia Bowl. The, these old, rich, booster, NIL-given whiteheads, <laughs> they hate Ole Miss. You know, I, I, <laughs> I can't say the jokes on air that my uncles would tell me at Thanksgiving about Ole Miss. That's how much they hate them, you know. A lot of pee jokes come in, come in uh, flying around Thanksgiving. So, uh, look, I, I I think that it's going to be when you cut them, when you cut open an LSU fan, and you say which game I think would be Alabama, even though they a lot of people hate Ole Miss too. So, Blake, like you mentioned, you're not going to survive or not going to have many three loss seasons in Baton Rouge and live to tell the tale. So, to say that the expectations nope. are high and there's a lot of pressure this year uh, might be the understatement of the century. And it's college football playoff robust, like we mentioned. The defense has got to take a step forward. The offense, it doesn't have to be as good as last year, but it's got to be pretty darn good. And Garrett Nussmeyer, to your point, probably more than anything, I don't know if it's raising the ceiling. He's got to raise the floor and eliminate the silly, eliminate the mistakes, no the turnovers, what have you. So saying all that to say, it's a massive year for Brian Kelly. Year three, right? We hear all the time, year three. This is the year we find out who you are. So what has to click in your mind? What's the thing that you identify this has got to click for LSU to hit that double-digit win mark and get to the college football play. You got to win week one because I feel like if you win week one, Chris, and you get the momentum, that means your defense is playing better. Confidence is a weird thing, man. We can X and O's this all we want to, but you get an LSU team at home at night, confidence versus Ole Miss. God, Chris, what happens if they're 6-0? Like, what, what, what happens? 
And that's the thing. And if you're five and one, you're four and one, oh man, we might not beat Ole Miss. So I, I just I, I think that because their schedule is so light in the very beginning and it gets tougher down the stretch, that confidence and momentum is going to be rolling. And all of those games being at home, by the way, at night, that's what I don't think people <laughs> like. I don't think people have realized that yet. Okay, good luck. Like LSU in a lot of those years had no business, like from 2010 to 2016. They had no they had no business being in the remote vicinity of almost beating Bama those years. Even in 17 and 18, like no re, no real remote reason. But because that game's at night and because stuff gets weird, voodoo starts coming out, I that's what that's what I'm banking on. I don't think LSU from top to bottom is as talented in areas as Ole Miss, but I don't think they're far off. And I think that that at, at home field advantage gives them enough advantage. Alabama, the same thing, man. I, I mean, if you can, if Brian Kelly can beat them in year one, he can beat them in year three, like coming back. And I just think that defensively, in that the what they're going to do defensively, I don't think they let Jalen Milrow run on them like they did the year before. Blake Rafino, AYS Sports, Rafino and Joe Show, one of the best in the business, and like I said, someone I'm grateful to call a friend. Blake, it's always a pleasure, man. Let folks know where they can check out all your work. Yeah, AYS Sports, uh, I mean, Chris, as long as Brian Kelly allows us to continue to go out to practice, we'll continue every single day on these practice reports. It's hot, Like I said in the open, it's hotter than a hoochie-coochie out here, but <laughs> we'll keep going out there. Rafino and Joe Show, Chris, tonight, um, we're going to break down our playoffs. We're going to give our 12. The Liberty Flames coming in at 12, baby. They're my <laughs> playoff lock right now. So we'll go through that, some some Heisman stuff. And then, like you, you I think you said last week, or, or earlier last week, I, I forget on Twitter, then we start breaking down games. So that Rafino and Joe show AYS is where you can catch all of our stuff. Blake, you're the man. I appreciate you taking the time. Look forward to seeing you in Baton Rouge this season, my man. We'll definitely do this again soon. Pyrans ain't ready, Chris. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs>